Our scripture reading this morning is found in 1 John chapter 5. We'll be reading 16 through 17. It reads, If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is no... There is a sin not leading to death. Man, thank you, George. Uh, it was nice to have that little rest between the song and my sermon because I don't think I could speak. That was amazing. Thank you. Wow. Um, God is good. Amen. Yeah, we had uh, the privilege this last week of uh, having our son home, and um, our daughter unfortunately had to go up to camp a little early, but uh, we had them all three there for a few days. And uh, earlier this week, my son and I had the, the cool opportunity to head up to Flagstaff, and uh, we got to do some backpacking up there. And uh, we went up, and uh, we parked there at the Snow Bowl, and we head up Humphreys Peak Trail, thinking we were going to go all the way up to the, the top and then come back down to the saddle and then go back around the backside on what they call the inner basin and down the Weatherford Trail, down almost to Schultz Pass Road and then cut back up around the other side on uh, the Kachina Trail and, and come back to the car. We were planning on spending a couple nights out there and uh, we started up Humphreys Peak and uh, it was a beautiful day, not very many people out, and uh, we were actually wondering why there weren't more people out. And uh, we got up to the saddle, and we ditched our backpacks under some, uh, some bushes there, and we head up to the top, saw the beautiful views, and God is awesome. The, the blanket of ponderosa pine trees, the, the clear, brilliant blue sky, you can see the north rim of the Grand Canyon from up there, and uh, one of my favorite places in the world. We hiked back down to the saddle, threw our packs on, and we started down the Weatherford Trail only to realize that even though it's summer, there's still quite a bit of snow up there, and uh, we weren't quite prepared for that. So we got a little ways out, and uh, my son, thankfully, is a little wiser than I am. He, he's had some training in mountaineering and, and climbing in snow and stuff, and um, we, we talked each other out of turning around and going back down Humphreys Peak Trail because um, that was better than sliding and meeting the jagged rocks at the bottom. So um, we had a good time doing that. But I just wanted to, to give a chance to, to say thank you, Eva, for that amazing song. Um, it reminded me of the mountains, and it reminded me of God's, uh, God's gift to us, that love. And we definitely do not deserve it, but uh, he gives it freely. So I want to say amen to that. But uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll start here this morning. Father, we thank you for giving us uh, the beauty in nature. We thank you for your love that you give to us, even though we're not deserving of it. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I pray that uh, we will all be blessed by hearing your word. I pray that you would somehow speak through me. Um, you could speak through a donkey, so I just, I know you can use me too, so we thank you for that as well. And uh, we just ask you to be your presence here today, ask you to guide us in all we do, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, those of you who know me know that I, there are a few things in life that I enjoy. And uh, you get me talking about certain things, uh, I like to talk about dogs, I like to talk about running, backpacking, camping, outdoors, things like that. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Dan Schilk and his wife invited me the other week to, to go out in their Toyota 4Runners. I like Toyotas, okay? And I love 4Runners, and they have a really nice one, by the way. And we went out uh, into the Four Peaks Wilderness area on Sabbath afternoon. We spent all afternoon just just trolling through those roads, and oh, it was amazing, the, the beauty out there. And uh, I didn't know that there were that many pine trees out there. I hadn't been as far as they'd take me. That, that was pretty cool. So there are certain things in life I love. I'm going to start by talking about one of those things, and that is dogs. I like dogs. I, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go as far to say that I actually love dogs. Dogs are super cool. I love big dogs, little dogs, furry dogs, hairless dogs. I mean, you, you, you name them, I, I, I like dogs. Um, but I do have some favorite breeds. Uh, my all-time favorite breed happens to be the Vishla, which is a, a Hungarian uh, kind of hound, kind of a mix between a, a I, I don't know how to describe it. It, it. 
it's just beautiful, sleek, lean dog. It can, it can run, and it's very active, very agile, very athletic dog. Kind of looks like one of those uh, Wamariners. Is that how you say that? I never know if I say that word right. Except it's more of a tan, kind of a, uh, a deer color. It's a beautiful dog. And uh, one of my other favorite breeds um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about today is I hesitate sometimes to say it in public because of the stigma that goes behind this dog. They, they have kind of a negative sig- uh, stigma. They've been kind of demonized in today's society. They were once known as the nanny breed. Some of you who know the dog I'm talking about will understand what I'm saying. But it is the American Pit Bull Terrier. And uh, some people are probably already crossing their arms thinking, I don't like this guy because he likes a violent, mean, bloodthirsty killer. Well, that is unfortunately a negative stigma that's been, I think, um, unduly placed upon the, that specific breed. Because I've met some amazing, nice, kind, gentle dogs um, in that breed. And, and it, I think more of it has to do with how they're raised and how they're brought up. But uh, those breeds are called the, the nanny uh, breed because they are so good with kids. And uh, you can pull on their ears. They're, they're, they have a high pain tolerance. They're very uh, loving. They're very loyal to their owners. And uh, part of the reason they had such a negative breed is because the wrong people got a hold of these dogs and they started using them for bull baiting and then later in pit fighting where they would fight other dogs. And one of the reasons they chose that specific breed was because of their loyalty to their owners. And uh, they are very strong, muscular. They're very small. So, you know, they go to these dog fights when these dogs weren't very well known yet. And uh, you guys ever read that um, book by um, Jack London, White Fang? Anybody ever read that book? In the book of White Fang, White Fang, which was a, um, was that a a wolf or a wolf hybrid? I don't know, but it was a a wolf-like, a wolf hybrid. Okay, it was a wolf hybrid. So we're talking about a big wolf-like dog. Probably uh, looked a little bit like Rocky on campus here, right? For those of you who know that dog. And... uh, this dog was going to, got captured, and they were using it to dog fight. They were abusing it, training it to be aggressive, and they put it in the ring, and they brought out this little, what they called a bulldog, which we know we would term now as probably a, a pit bull. And uh, this little bulldog probably weighed about 40 or 50 pounds, but just solid, strong neck, jaws, and, and muscular little guy. And uh, of course, everybody's going to put money on the big wolf-looking dog, Right. But this little bulldog goes in there, and it almost killed White Fang. And uh, the reason I'm telling you this story is because not I'm trying to I'm not trying to um, you know paint that in a good way or anything. That dog fighting is a horrible thing. But these people use these dogs for that because of the the fact that they could reach in and separate dogs without the dogs turning on them. A lot of times, dogs get so charged with adrenaline that they just they don't know what they're biting, and they'll just nip and bite at everything. But these pit bulls are so focused to the task at hand, combined with their 100% loyalty to their owners, that these guys could reach in with their hands and pull the dogs apart. Well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of times they had to use a, a special bar to pry the, the jogs off because they would, they would latch on, and, and it's kind of gruesome. I, I, I hope I'm not putting any bad images into your mind. The point being is that they could reach in without getting bit and pull the dogs apart to separate them. There's a story in the Bible of a man who had that type of dedication and loyalty to his task at hand. If you want to open me, open uh, with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, We read one of the most uh, sad stories in the Bible, yet it is infiltrated with some very, very amazing lessons for us. And this is David, Bathsheba, and the man that I'm going to try to draw a little bit of a lesson from, Uriah. Uriah in this story represents what I would like to have, that, that pit bull loyalty, dedication, and focus in the midst of turmoil. Now, David, as we know, as we read through the story, as a matter of fact, let's, let's read through this. I, I, I've always been told in teaching and preaching that you shouldn't read long scriptures and things like that. But this is too good not to read. Amen? Can, can we read this together? Um, 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, just listen. Okay, this is story time with, with Dean Mark, okay? Um, I'm going to read to you here from chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. It says, It happened in the spring of the year 
at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Hmm, first mistake. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for he was for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. And the reason it mentioned that little detail about her being cleansed from her impurity lets us know that she was not pregnant from Uriah. Okay, she was, she was not pregnant at the time, so it was David's child for sure. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. The Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And I don't know about you guys, but if I was in battle, sleeping on the ground with a bunch of stinky guys eating military rations, in my mind, I'd be like, I'm going to go home. I'm going to have me some, some haystacks or some special K loaf, you know, some, some good home cooking, right? Maybe some chocolate cheesecake, right, Jared? Vegan, of course. And be able to see my wife, you know, and, and I don't know if they had kids previous to that. I'm assuming not. Um, and that, wouldn't that be awesome? But he knew in his mind that he had a task at hand that he needed 100% total focus on. And that that would be, even though a good thing, it would be a distraction from the task at hand. And as we read on, as I just lost my place, where, where was I? 11, thank you. And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David, is frustrated in his heart, I'm sure, said to Uriah, wait here today also, and, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And that evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So even in a state of, you know, I don't know about you guys, but at Thanksgiving when you eat too much turkey, you get tired, right? He's tired. Not to mention he had been drinking, so he's now a little, little tipsy. His mind probably wasn't right, but he was still, still focused. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the very hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. And we go on and, and we, we, we read more about this. David went and sent and they married and um, he had the baby. And then we go on, and this is, this is something I want to touch upon a little bit later. We go on to read um, in chapter 12 about David's confession. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. 
The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his, at his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And the traveler, and a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the way, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man after hearing the story. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done all this shall surely die. And he shall restore four, fourfold to the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. You are the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives um, into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and all Judah. And if it had been too little, I also would have given you much more. And it goes on, and we, we, we learn that there were many, many, many negative consequences that took place in David's family with his own son, in his kingdom, the people felt the aftermath of David's sin. But two points I wanted to point out here, and I, I think we need to focus on Uriah, the example. And it, as a matter of fact, later in, in 2 Samuel, in I think chapter 23, it gives the list of David's valiant men, right? I mean, all, all, all us guys sitting in here, could you imagine your name etched forever in God's word as being a valiant man, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be better than the NFL Hall of Fame? I hope. For some of us are thinking, well, I don't know. Be, to be a valiant man of David, guess, who, guess whose name was last on that list? Uriah the Hittite. He was listed as one of David's faithful and valiant men. And I think that is an amazing example for us that the things of this world, as much comfort as they give us, as much joy as they give us, and pleasure and, and worldliness and all that type of thing, when we stay focused to the task at hand that God has given us as soldiers to carry his gospel out to the world, to raise our families in a God-fearing home, when we stay focused to that, we can be like Uriah. Now, the outcome of his life was unfortunately death, but that was the first death. And the resurrection, when Uriah is given his glorified eternal body, and David, who we also learn, has had a deep, heartfelt, sincere repentance for the sin that he had committed, will also be in that kingdom. And the two men embrace I'm sure Uriah might have a question or two when he, if he understands the whole story that took place. But we're talking about two men who uh, are, are going to meet in heaven and have some crazy stories to tell. Um, and with the heart of God, I know that forgiveness will be there on Uriah's side too for what David had done. But let's look at David now for a minute. David sinned, amen? You know, did he steal a cookie from the cookie jar? Is that the kind of sin we're talking about here? Uh, just a little bit, just a little bit more, right? If we look back at our Bible verse, it says in 1 John 5, 16 and 17, read there in the middle, it says, um, there is a sin not leading to death, and it also says that there is a sin leading to death. Okay, now I don't know about you, but when I look at that sin that David committed, and he actually convicted himself, he said, that man shall surely die. And then when Nathan said, Nathan said you are the man, can you imagine the searing pain that David felt in his heart when the realization of his anger toward this other man was rightly deserving upon himself? Can, can you imagine that searing pain that took place in David's heart? I, I can't, but I know it was, it was deep and it was true and it was, it, was, it was pretty intense. Let's take an example from another person in the Bible here because I want to do a little comparing and contrasting here between 
David, his sin, and the aftermath that took place. And then we're going to flip back a little bit earlier in the book of 1 Samuel. Um, let's look here at 1 Samuel chapter 13. There we are. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we'll start reading at verse 5. 1 Samuel 13, 1, 3. 1 Samuel 13, verse 5. We're talking about King Saul here now, okay? King Saul, okay, David's predecessor, or is that right? Predecessor, one came before, so um, make sure I get my terminology right here. So we're talking about um, Saul, and it says here, uh, Then the, Philistine, the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as as, and people as the sand, which is one on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash, to the east of Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And all the people followed him, trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together in Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God which he commanded you, for now the Lord will have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now this is key here next. Verse 15, it said, Then Samuel arose, and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Now why would I say that's important? Let me ask you another question. What did David do when the prophet told him about his sin? He recognized his guilt, and he had a deep, heartfelt repentance. What did Saul do when the prophet told him of his sin? He went up and numbered the people, right? It doesn't mention anything about a heartfelt repentance. And it, was this, it doesn't seem like much of a sin, but we can see how sin is like a snowball in, in a person's life. If we don't recognize sin and repent from it, it grows like a snowball rolling down a hill. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And later, if we look in 1 Samuel, um, I think chapter 28, if you want to turn there real quick, 1 Samuel chapter 28, we read about the end of Saul's life. And we won't take time to read it all, um, but you, can, you might want to go back this afternoon and maybe check that out in um, 1 Samuel chapter 28. When Saul, here we have, he's, he's, he's getting ready to go in the heat of battle again. He's confused. He had come to the point in his life where he, has, he had hardened his heart, okay? He had hardened his heart. Samuel the prophet had died. He didn't know who to turn to. And so in his frustration and his, his chaotic state of mind, he decides that he is going to seek out, his servant told him about a medium or a witch or whatever you want to call her, from Endor. And he decides, I'm going to go ask this witch for counsel because Samuel's not here. So he goes to the witch of Endor. She does her little hocus pocus, and she brings up a spirit which he believes was the, the spirit of the recently deceased 
Samuel. But we know that when a person dies, according to the Bible, they lay to rest in waiting on the Lord's second coming. And that this spirit was not Samuel, but it was a medium imitating Samuel. And it, it tells of, of, of Saul's doom, and he gives him this, this horrible prophecy, and it actually came true. And uh, I don't think the uh, demon at that point had any reason to lie because he's already, his heart is already hardened. We haven't seen the, um, the track record in Saul's life of repentance or a God-fearing heart, a humble heart. He's become prideful, selfish, greedy, and he had turned his back on God. And he had committed what many Bible scholars would call the un the unpardonable sin. He had grieved away the Holy Spirit and he had come to the point, like the devil, where there was, there was God, God knew his heart was set. He, his course, his sails were set and they weren't turning around. If he had in his heart the possibility to repent and turn around, you know, if, if that was still within his character, I'm sure God would have been a little bit more patient and allowed time to unfold. But God knows the heart. Okay? We're not the judge. We can't look at this and say one way or another, but God can, and uh, that was the end of him. So we have here a very, very distinct difference between how two different people dealt with sin in their lives. Amen? We have David, who sinned an immense sin, destroyed the, con the continuity of his family, his country, because of one, well, not one, he, he committed adultery, he murdered, and you think about it, when he sent Uriah to the front line, not only did Uriah die, but there were many other men who were put in a very, uh, predic you know, quite a predicament there, and they also lost their lives. So there were others who actually lost their lives along with Uriah. So we have an adulterer, a murderer, right? A liar, a deceiver. Yet we also have someone who is called a man after the heart of God, right? The apple of God's eye, right? Here, here is a man who in his heart, hated sin. Now, if we look at our Bible verse for today, 1 John 5, 16 and 17, if anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, I wonder what that means. He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that we should not pray about that. All, righteousness, all unrighteousness is sin. And, and there is a sin not leading to death. The difference, and I, I shared this a few weeks ago, and I, may, I don't know, how are we doing on time? I'm, we're good? Okay, let me take a minute. I, I, I don't know, maybe I should even share this again, but you guys remember the story about the cat and the pig, right? Those of you who were here last time I, I spoke. That is an amazing illustration of the difference between a committed Christian and someone who does not have faith in God. Okay? We, I'll, I'll just say this again. For repetition deepens impression. Amen? Okay, so this is a good, cute little story. The kids will even like it. Pigs and cats. I mean, we all like animals, right? The cat is going to represent, we'll say, David. Okay? The pig is going to represent Saul. The mud puddle in front of both the cat and the pig represents the sin in their lives. Okay, for David, that sin was adultery, murder, lying, deceitfulness, all that kind of stuff. For Saul, it was much of the same, yet how they dealt with that differed greatly. Okay, when you ever see a cat get muddy or dirty or, or whatnot, right? Some of you are shaking your heads yes. When a cat gets, in, if, you, if you just plopped a cat into a mud puddle, what's it going to do? It is, it's out of there, right? It's going to jump out of there as fast as you threw it in. And it's going to be on the side licking itself, cleaning it off, shaking off the mud and all that kind of stuff. If you took a little pig and you plopped that down into the mud puddle, it's going to snort down in it and, and get its whole body roller. Right? It's going to wallow in that mud. It's going to enjoy that, right? Okay? Doesn't the Bible said we, it's something about enjoying sin for a season, you know? The pig is going to like that season of sin, and it's going to try to stay in that mud as long as possible. The cat wants out, the pig cherishes it. The difference here, they're talking about the sin that leads to death and the sin that leads not to death. Do Christians sin? Yeah, we do. We fall, we make mistakes, we stumble. And just like that cat, though, a Christian is one to get out as quick as possible. We recognize our situation. 
like David, blinded in the stupor of lust, selfishness, pride, all of a sudden his friend came, gave him good counsel, and smacked him in the face with the reality of his situation. And he immediately, it's like the scales fell from his eyes, and he looked in the mirror and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. What have I done? He wanted out, right? He recognized it. He manned up, and he said, I am guilty of all charges. Lord, do with me as you will. And then we have Saul, of course, like we had mentioned earlier. Nathan comes, and he tells him of his sin. And what does he do? He goes up and starts counting the people, right? He doesn't have, he doesn't have that repentance. He had turned from God, and he's... And it, for crying out loud, he starts seeking witches for advice. These same witches who previously he had ordered to be put to death. So we can see a pretty grave uh, difference between the two. I want us to leave here today with the understanding, um, especially when we read this, it's a little confusing. And uh, we should pray for others who sin, right? Um, but when it talks here, um, it says, it also says here, I... I um, it says, I do not say that he should pray about that, talking about the sin that leads to death. We unfortunately don't have the divine discernment to know if someone has committed the unpardonable sin. Amen? So brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, for your loved ones, your friends, your family, we should pray for people, whether we think they've gone off the deep end or not, because God can, can turn things around in our lives. Amen? And I don't think that's what it's saying. It's not saying don't pray for them, they've gone too far. What it's saying is that there is a sin that you, even though we're praying for them, we should probably pray for them, but like in Saul's case, if a bunch of people were praying for Saul, even though he's already committed the unpardonable sin, is Saul going to be saved because of other people's prayers for him? No. He's, he doesn't want to be in heaven. God's not going to force someone to be in heaven who doesn't want to be there. We can't pray someone there but we can pray for their circumstances and their situation and the Holy Spirit and God's working in their lives to give them every, every opportunity to choose to be there. Amen? And that's what it's talking about here. Ultimately, who we serve from our heart is what matters. And there's going to be a lot of people, and the Bible talks about this in the end times when Jesus comes in those clouds of glory to give eternal life to those who follow him, there are going to be some people who outwardly, seemingly have done all the right things, yet they loathe those things because of the, the pressing constraints of Christianity. But for some reason or another, they have forced themselves into this model of a good Christian, right? They do the right things, they eat the right foods, they go to church, they, they do all their, their maybe a, on the board, and they, they give tithe and all these types of things. But deep down in the heart, they wished they didn't have to do those things. And God's going to come again, and they're going to say, but Lord, Lord. And he's going to look at him and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. And then there are going to be those like David, probably like you, and surely like me, who have fallen into that mud puddle one too many times, yet we want out. Amen? Our heart is wicked, it's de deceitful. We can't trust our heart, yet we have this natural desire to, to always fall into sin. We have to overcome that. And my prayer for each and every one of us today is that our love of the light will overcome and suppress the sin, and so that it will fade into the darkness and become nothingness, and that the light and the love of God will rule in our lives. I want to end with a real quick story that uh, took place when I was... Uh, living in Indiana as a little boy, and uh, we had a big family reunion, and one of my cousins had come from, um, from out of state. I didn't see him very much. He was about two years older than me, I believe, and uh, we had got into some mischief, and we started fooling around down in my grandparents' basement, okay? And I thought this guy was cool, and I wanted to impress him and, and whatnot, and as my uncles and aunts and grandparents and parents and everybody were upstairs and they were all talking and sharing stories and um, you know some of them were drinking a little too much and, and that kind of thing and having a, a grand old time up there I guess you could say with in quotes there um, my cousin and I were downstairs and we were getting bored 
You know, all the old people were talking upstairs. It was nighttime. There wasn't a lot to do. So we start riff snorting around the basement, looking in boxes and, and tearing the place up. And then, what can we do? What can we do? And uh, we found a, a beer can. So we opened the beer and we drank the beer. And so, you know, you're talking about, you know, nine, ten year old kid drinking beer. That's, a, that's not a good combination. And then we found some spray paint. And we thought, oh, what are we going to do with the spray paint? Our minds were already fuzzy with, with immaturity combined with intoxication. So we have this can of spray paint, and we, there were was, there was some storage boxes back there, and we think, oh, that'd be funny to spray paint a word on the wall. And so uh, what, what do sailors write in? I, I wish that was the word we chose, but it wasn't. Unfortunately, we wrote that four-letter word in spray paint on the back of my grandparents' um, wall, and then all of a sudden, um, it's amazing how after you sin, you sober up pretty quick. And I look, I stood back and I looked, and all of a sudden I just became ghost white, and I realized what I had done to my grandparents, who I loved very much, and I liked them. I didn't want to hurt them. And this was permanent spray paint. Well, we went upstairs and acted good, you know, we put the boxes back over the thing, and it wasn't but maybe a couple months later when my phone rang, and my dad answered the phone. Hey, Dad, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. blah. What? Mark did what? Mark! And I come running out of the room, tail tucked so far in between my legs that I could see it out in front of me, and I was like, oh, I knew, I knew it, was, it was all downhill. He asked me what happened, blah, 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 and of course I blamed my cousin, and I'm sure he probably blamed me. But uh, being the younger of the two, you know, I think my cousin got the brunt of the discipline, but I, that was not a pretty day for me. I'd walk down, and I had to face my grandparents face to face and say, I'm sorry. But in my heart, I really was sorry. The difference there is if I had gone to my grandparents with, you know, you'd, Tommy and Jane are fighting in the playground and they tell her you're sorry. I'm sorry. Humph. You know, it wasn't that kind of sorry. I had tears in my eyes. I really, really was sorry. They forgave me and life went on. It was hard to look them in the eyes for a while after that. But uh, that, that's the difference, folks. That's the difference. We screw up. Amen? But when we do, we have an advocate with the Father. And as Eva saying this morning, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. So uh, I guess that wraps up this sermon. And uh, I just want you guys to leave with the, the, the knowledge and the comfort knowing that we do have that forgiveness from the Father and that there is a sin that leads to death, but there is also a sin that leads not to death and uh, not encouraging us to go out and sin, but it is encouraging to know that when we fall, God gives us a way out through Jesus Christ. Amen?